few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets. And yet, across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes. And slowly and surely, they drew their plans against us. <laughs> My first encounter with H.G. Wells as the War of the Worlds was my dad coming over to wish me well the night before going out on tour. After wishing me luck, he hands me this book, H.G. Wells as the War of the Worlds, which I wasn't familiar with. After one read, I was hooked. It was a magnificent story. Well, the, the sort of narrator figure of, of the whole of the, the War of the Worlds story is um, the journalist, um, uh, which was uh, originally done by Richard Burton in Jeff's uh, musical version. Characters and, and situations that you're familiar with suddenly now kind of open up more and kind of get to breathe. So you really explore the, the relationship between the journalist and the artilleryman, for instance, that David Essex played in the original and that Taron Edgerton plays in this. The artilleryman is kind of kind of damaged beyond repair by the events that take place in the story. He develops this kind of fantasy about creating an underground world where um, uh, the best of the species will, will hide and rebuild humanity and eventually fight. It really shows the horror and stress of the story. They can fly? I believe so. Five nights back I saw a couple of fighting machines following something big. I could only make out the lights, but it was floating in the air. Then it's all over for humanity. If they can fly, they'll conquer the world. They will. Humanity is done. I think it's probably fair to say that there is a greater amount of detail in the world and the characters and the dialogue, while still retaining all of the atmosphere and emotion that Jeff's music brings. The eve of the war uh, was to me like this overture and I had these notes in my mind that I, that I wound up with. And so forth. Uh, but then I added a, what's called a pedal note. It shares one chord, but doesn't share the other. So you get this, which makes it sound much more menacing, I think. Then I moved away from the, the keyboard, the piano, and scored it for this symphonic string orchestra that just thunders in. Uh, and that's the difference between writing a tune and orchestrating. Because the, the writing has been able to open up the characters more yeah. and, we, and we now see and hear scenes between the journalist and Carrie and, 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 and explore a more emotional aspect to it. So it, the story now starts to have, um, I suppose, a different kind of emotional aspect because we now we now get a sense of what could be lost. There was always this particular piece of artwork and it always had um, the figure of this woman in a green dress. Carrie in the original album is just mentioned, she's not actually a character, but I always just loved that name for some reason and put it together with that piece of artwork. Dotted throughout, there are direct uh, usages of our script, but that's really only as an anchor to remind people who do know it uh, it's helped me from the way we're laying out the, the score. You, you know, you didn't think when you were doing the original version of this that uh, some 16-year-old Welsh kid was going <laughs> to give the album to a 10-year-old and yeah. it was going to change his life. And yeah, it does. That's the amazing thing about this yeah. sort of work is that you have no idea how it's going to spread like a virus. Like the red weed. Like a bacteria, <laughs> like the red weed, yeah. And who it's going to touch and affect and how it's going to affect their lives. And that's one of the extraordinary things about, you know, enduring classic pieces of work like you've done. You know, I'm here because I'm a fan of the original, of the original and, and I think everything that people loved about the original will manifest itself in this one too.